a second. Here we go. Now we are recording. So welcome to those of you joining us on YouTube as well. So my name is Jamie Vivak, and I am the Will County Director for the Conservation Foundation. Everybody's muted and your cameras are off. This is a webinar format, just so you know. So if you're, I don't know, joining us in your pajamas or something, it's okay, no judgment here. We can't see you, so no worries. Um, this webinar is being recorded for everyone to enjoy later, just like all of our other uh, webinars that we've been doing now for about six months, which I think is kind of cool. They're all stored on our YouTube channel. So go ahead and check us out, the Conservation Foundation on YouTube, and you can see all of the past recordings that we've been doing. If you have any questions during this, please use the Q&A box that lets everybody else see your questions. Also makes it easier for us to find them all at the end, since questions can sometimes get lost in the chat. So at the end of the presentation, we'll have a little bit of time left for Q&A there. So for your safety too, you should only be able to see what I post in the chat, but just in case I missed a setting or somebody gets around it, you know how, how those things go. Um, please don't click links other than what I may post there for you. On the TCF side of things, these webinars are offered free to the public, but we do encourage you to consider a donation or membership. The more people we have attending these, the more it does cost us to run them. So at the end of the webinar, you will magically be taken to a page with a whole bunch of resources of different things you might be interested in. So native plants, or um, we also have our rain garden and rain barrel brochures there, our butterfly brochures, all kinds of great information um, that we have collected for you. So if you're enjoying them, I do encourage you to donate to help keep us running. Um, you can also check the box to become a member so that you get to enjoy our wide variety of members only stuff. And to sweeten the deal, we also um, are taking part in a challenge right now. We have a grant that will match all new donations through the end of the year up to $75,000. So if you donate $25, we get $50. So if you've been thinking about donating, uh, now is a really great time to do it. So um, we really do appreciate all of you who have been donating all throughout all of these webinars. So upcoming webinars on Wednesday, October 14th, next week, we will be joined. I'm so excited. I've been trying to get him for a while, but he's been a little bit busy. Uh, Farmer Jason, he's going to be talking about organic farming. So those of you who are familiar with the Conservation Foundation know that our location in Naperville, the McDonald Farm, is actually a working organically uh, rated farm. So Farmer Jason, who helps to run our farm, is going to come on and he's going to talk about all the great things that he does the techniques that he uses to keep our farm organic, things like that. And he'll also have some tips for your garden. So for those of you preparing and planning your garden for next year, he'll have some really great tips for you. So thank you all so much for attending today. And uh, joining us by phone is Bill Bedrosian from Bedrock Earthscapes. I have worked with Bill on a number of different projects and he is always such a pleasure to work with. He is so knowledgeable about everything and so friendly and I wish you could see his face because he has the kindest eyes and the best mustache I have ever seen. So <laughs> Bill, I am going to turn you, it over to you now. All right, well thank you everybody for joining us. My name is Bill Bedrosian, as Jamie said, and um, I own and operate a small business called Bedrock Earthscapes, and our business is to maintain and install native areas. So most of our maintenance is actually created native areas as opposed to remnant natives, which there aren't many around. And so th that practice lends itself to areas where native plants are being used as stormwater best management practices. Hence, the title for today, Naturalized Detention Basins, because natives are used a lot in our area and required by ordinance for many of the municipalities to be used around detention basins that are installed when new construction is being done. In the past, that wasn't always the case, and so a lot of homeowners associations or communities end up with basins with erosion problems, uh, sediment issues and so forth and in many cases they will um, modify those basins and naturalize them convert them to native plantings 
as part of the restoration of those basins. So that's what our topic is going to be focused on today. And I wish we could be a little more conversational and you could ask questions because I typically like to ask, are there any specific things you want to make sure we cover today so that I can incorporate those as we go through the slides? But we don't, so we'll begin. Okay, so first, the issue is typically asked, why do we use natives? So hopefully you can see this slide. Up in the upper left, you're seeing a old turf area that was killed out and is being drilled with native seed. And on the right, that same area after it's been established. So one obvious reason that we use natives is for beauty. I mean, I think that turf is not a sustainable landscape practice for our future. And I think we need to be looking at those practices. I mean, right now, turf is the number one crop in the United States. We use more fertilizer, pesticides, and water to grow turf than we do agricultural crops. So it's doesn't it, then then it, it is the leading crop. I'll put it that way. So that just doesn't make sense, right? It's not sustainable to take clean, fresh water and irrigate lawns with it. It doesn't make sense to fertilize turf grass when we have people that don't have enough food to eat. And, and it doesn't make sense to to cover our ground with turf that only has um, you know a coefficient of, of water absorption that's very similar to asphalt when we instead we could put natives down and have that water penetrate back into the earth and be cleansed filtered and and clean so it's just not a sustainable practice I've been in the landscape industry now for close to uh, for over forty seven years. And I've done a lot of different things, but I've been focused on natives in my business for the last 12, but I've had about 25 years of experience with the native plants. So the next slide talks a little bit about the benefits of native plants. So water runoff reduction, water quality improvement, air quality enhancement through carbon sequestration, elimination for irrigation and chemicals, promotes groundwater recharge, as we can get the water to go into the ground instead of run over the surface, right? And if we can do those things, and the reason why these natives are used a lot is because we can reduce conventional stormwater infrastructure by using green infrastructure instead. Of course, enhancing biodiversity and uh, habitat quality for pollinators, for birds, for small mammals. Um, the aesthetics, I like the natives because Almost every month, the native areas have a different look to them. So you start in the early spring with some early spring forbs starting to bloom. You get different colors, yellows, purples. You know, and then in the late season, you have the grasses turning amber in color and moving with the wind. It's just you have this variety of pleasing aesthetics throughout the year. And then it gives us the opportunity, too, to talk about um, the benefit to the pollinators and, and to cleaning water and to cleaning air and so forth and hopefully to get people to to understand why it makes sense to use natives and there are so many different ways to use them right i mean and i'll talk about that in a, in a little while the the water treatment train goes beyond you know what just detention basins where the water falls you know do we collect it in rain barrels can we put it through bioswales and then does it go to detention basins? Are there level spreaders that we can run them out so it percolates across the surface of the ground? Uh, pervious pavements, all kinds of different things that we can do with rainwater to treat it as a resource instead of a waste product. And then the last point here on the benefits of native plants is the long-term reduction in maintenance costs. If you're currently mowing an area, multiple times. So where most of us live, it's probably somewhere between 22 and 28 times a year that you have to run a lawnmower across. And if you think about this on an acre basis, not just your own residential lawn, but per acre, you know, on an average first class landscape, if they're mowing 26 times a year, fertilizing three times a year, uh, weed killing two or two to four times a year, maybe five or six times a year, irrigating, all those practices that go into maintain turf, it costs somewhere around $3,500 per acre to maintain turf, most of that being in labor. 
maintenance costs for native areas, we only do maintenance five times a year, some people four times a year, and as they get older, maybe less. You know, we use very little chemical. If we do, we use, we're just spot herbiciding areas to eliminate perennial weeds. We brush cut, we mow, we burn. So the maintenance costs are much lower once converted. <clears throat> and if you have a budget for maintenance, you can use that maintenance budget to do the conversion at no cost to the owner eventually. So there's a variety of benefits for native plants that you want to keep in mind and why they're being used. Now here's a slide. The next slide is one about integrated water treatment train that I was just talking about a minute ago. So when water falls, you know, where does it go? Well, first it hits our paved surfaces and our roofs. So you have green roofs maybe, you could have pervious uh, pavement systems, you could harvest the rainwater, you know, you can have these retention systems. So all of these different aspects of water, we need to think through that whole process. And one of them is the native landscape systems. So as we go on to that, I want you to take a look at this. And I don't know if you'll be able to see this slide moving on your screen or not. But the historical patterns of hydrology is that the water used to rain fall on the surface and it would percolate into the ground. And then over days or months or years, the water would then percolate back up in the low areas. And that's what a wetland was. A wetland was supplied by water from underneath the ground, not over the ground. And so that meant that the wetland areas had a constant level of water. It had a constant temperature of water because as the water comes out through the ground, it's coming out at about 50 degrees. And so year round, you had clean, uh, constant temperatures and constant water levels. And that's what our wetlands were. So, you know, today's wetlands, right? So we had a constant clean discharge flows, year round stable conditions, and that's what our native plants grew in. So what happens today? Here's our contemporary hydrology. The water falls today, you see that brown line going across the surface into what we call wetlands, which are areas that we scoop out holes in the ground and dump the surface water in as it gets laden with sediment, salts, oils, fertilizers, heat, dirt, and it goes into those low areas and it bounces the water level up. And then over a period of time, it drains out and the water level goes down. So the dirty water gets filled up again and then it slowly drains back out again. So it bounces up and down and up and down. So think about this. In historical patterns of hydrology, did the water bounce up and down? No, it didn't. The water had a, had a constant chemistry in it. And the plants that grew there, the things that we call wetland plants, are plants that were adapted to those conditions, the historical conditions, not the current conditions. But we still, designers still, engineers still say, oh, well, if they were wetland plants, then we can plant those same wetland plants in our redefined wetland areas, which aren't wetland areas at all, and have them handle all of our new system of hydrology with dirt and pollutants and heat over the surface. Do you think they're going to survive? Well, remember, a plant will only grow in a habitat to which it's adapted. The plants that we use, the native plants that we use, are not adapted to bouncing dirty water. So if a plant will only grow in habitats to which they're adapted, we can't really engineer these solutions and say, oh, well, that was a wetland plant, so we're going to put that plant where the water's deep, and we're going to put this plant where the water's shallow, and we're going to put these plants where it's dry on the upper banks. That's how we do it today. That is how we do it today and sometimes with pretty disastrous results. So think about these things as you're looking at the detention basins that you're maintaining or having a hard time maintaining. So under this system, in these type of conditions, the only plants that'll survive are typically cattails, phragmites, reed canary grass, purple loose strife, you know, all the non-desirable plants are plants that, you know, have are, are able to withstand some of these conditions. And so if you end up with a detention basin, sometimes the conditions that are there are the cause that only non-desirable plants are growing. Um, and sometimes it's uh, some other situations. So you kind of have to think through 
really what the cause is of your problem. So a couple of key concepts for you. Plants will only grow in habitats to which they're adapted. And we are recreating native plantings in the built environment and in disturbed areas. So what we're calling native areas mostly today are really recreated native plantings that we're trying to establish in some type of a disturbed area. So even though we're using natives as best management practices for stormwater, what builders do is they go in and they scrape the earth and then they cover it over with six inches of black dirt and then they plant, have us plant native plants on top and think, oh, well, native plants have deep roots. They'll do great. You know, they'll do all the work that we didn't do. Well, native plants historically didn't grow in areas that had compacted clay six inches down. So they will break that up eventually, but it's going to take years and years to do that. But keep these concepts in mind as we, as we walk uh, through the rest of the slides. So there are a variety of different types of seed mixes that you can use in your native plantings. There's low profile mixes, there's tall grass mixes. There are forb, uh, mixes high in forbs, and there are mixes that are grasses only. So in the built environment, it's different from the wide open plains and tall grass prairies that were here historically. So um, you wanna think about what are people gonna see and what are they used to? They're not gonna want a seven foot tall uh, planting right outside their condominium patio. So you need to think about these low, and low profile in natives means probably four feet, where a tall grass is more around the six or seven feet tall, it can be even higher in some cases. But so low profile doesn't mean 12 inches, it means more like three feet. So here's a couple, this is, these are, this is actually the same basin at different times of the year. In the left, in the earlier spring with some of the uh, purple prairie clover, purple uh, cone flowers, a little bit of uh, uh, baptisia there, and then on the right, you know, more of the yellow cone flowers, black eyed Susan, some of the sylphium starting to come in later in the year, about August type of time. So this, this is, you know, these are beautiful plantings that can be used around detention basins, and you can see the water in that one. Here, these are, you know, dominantly native forb plantings. Um, Liatris up on the upper left, kind of a little bit moisture area on the banks, uh, a prairie planting there in front of the Cabela's in the center that we installed a few years ago, a you know, nice variety of mixes. And on the right is kind of more wetland plants. You see the rattlesnake master, you see the um, vervain, some sedges in there, some swamp milkweed. You know, so the plants are even in these pictures, they're only growing in habitats to which they're adapted. You don't see some of the other pl plants in the one in the upper right that you see in the center picture. Because when we put the seed down, the seed then decides where it wants to grow and which of those plants in that seed mix, they're going to grow in those microenvironments that they like. So plants only grow in habitats to which they adapt, they, they, to which they're adapted. And so when you choose your seed mixes, you try to choose them for the habitat that you're planting. Here's native grasses a little bit later in the season, probably September in the upper picture and uh, in July on the right, grasses and grass-like plants, they usually group them together. So in addition to the grasses, you have the sedges and the rushes. So the lower picture is kind of a wet edge with a tall, dark rush and then some sedges there. In the upper left picture, you can see that native band that looks like it's probably Indian grass turning uh, amber there in the fall really makes it look nice. And you can actually see in that picture, you can see the upper brown band, but then closer to the water, you'll see a little bit more of a greenish band. Again, different habitats, the different plant communities that are growing and are able to grow. That grass isn't growing any further down the bank and those wetland plants aren't growing any further up the bank because of the conditions around that detention basin. So, Let's talk about where is this done. So where are native plantings done in detention areas? You know, why is it done? And then how, how do we do it? So it's done in a variety of, of basins. They can be a wet basin. They can be a dry bottom basin. Um, it's done in park districts. It's done in homeowners associations. It's done in commercial sites. It's done in municipalities. 
So there's a wide variety of areas where these detention basins are used. And, and these basins are used to allow, most construction specifications require that the site that is built out has the same uh, rate of flow off that site after construction that it had before construction. So they, de they design a detention basin to hold that water and then meter it out after the rain is over at the same rate that it used to leave that site before construction. So they used restrictors in those basins to do that. And that's what causes the bounce in these ponds is that all the water flows in, but then it can only leave at a certain rate because by regulation or by design, it only leaves at a certain rate. So that's something you also want to consider when you're establishing these basins, that those restrictors do not flood that basin while you're establishing it or else your establishment can fail because your plants can get flooded before they're established. All right, so let's let's take a look at a few of these. So you can use this on pond banks. This happens to be a park. And in the upper left, you'll see what happened. That was a turf basin, turf edge basin, that the park district personnel started to not mow along the edge of the pond because their mowers would slip and slide down the banks and end up in the water. So they started mowing about you know, six, eight feet away from the edge, then it moves to 10 feet, then it moves to 12 feet, so they get up to the top of the basin where it's fairly flat. And over the years, alders have come in and uh, willows come in, and then the, you know, weedy herbaceous material underneath. So you're seeing up in the upper left, that is all volunteer material along the, the, the uh, pond there that needed to be removed. The upper right picture then is after that's been removed, the bank has been regraded, Lower left is after seeding and blanketing, and you'll notice on the lower edge, it's a darker brown blanket than the upper edge. The lower edge was actually, we used a combination core, which is coconut, core material and some straw, and then the upper blanket is straw. And the reason we use the core blanket lower down is because this basin does have some bounce. And as that water level goes up and down, there's a little more erosive forces there. And the core blanket is more tenacious. It's a rating of 150 versus the straw blanket of 75, uh, twice the amount that will withstand the erosion effects. And then the lower right, you'll see the core log along the edge of the water. So that's a coconut fiber log, about 12 inches in diameter, staked and, and roped down. And then on the upper edge, we put a snow fence in to control wildlife, human wildlife, not animal wildlife, to keep the humans out of there to allow the natives to establish because all these ponds in the parks, people like to fish them a lot. And if we let people walk in there while it's establishing, we'll trample the natives and damage them before they get established. So we use core logs on large bodies of water where there is wave motion. And it's the wave motion, if you look at the upper right hand picture up there, you know, that's very calm right now, but in the winter months, you know, the wind blows and it gets, and that'll erode away the bank if it doesn't, if it isn't planted and doesn't have native vegetation. So what happens here is you have plants that grow down the bank and you have native plants that grow in the water edge called emergent plants. And as the water freezes in the winter, the ice expands. And if you have a hard edge or if you have a slightly eroded edge, that ice butts up against the edge of that soil and then cuts under it and lifts it up. And so year after year of that water freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing, that ice expanding, undercutting that bank, you end up with a, a ledge and you end up with that soil falling into the, into the pond and the body of water. So to eliminate that, we've been using native plants with that taper and you go from prairie plants at the top, the wet edge plants along the water to emergent plants in the water creating a continuum of vegetation that knits the soil together with their deep native roots and holds that soil. Now, as when the ice freezes, instead of it butting up against the edge of a pond, it slides up over that tapered surface. And as the pond expands in the wintertime, now the ice sheets move up the bank and break off. And then when they contract, they go back out again. So instead of undercutting the bank, they can slide up and down. So it's a combination of, you know, again, the grade of the bank, the gradation of the different plants as they move down the bank and into the water, but you got to protect that during the establishment time to make sure that stuff can get established, hence 
the core logs along the edge, the core blankets along the water edge. And if you don't have a lot of water motion, you don't have a lot of wave motion, and the freezing is not as much of an issue, and it's a small basin, you can get away with just using a core blanket along the edge and not having to use a core log. And then we've also gone from orange construction fence or snow fencing to green, which is a little less objectionable in the build environment. We typically keep that fence up from establishment in the spring of one year until the 4th of July the next year. Because by the 4th of July, your native plants are typically up about waist high. And even though it's only the second year of their growth, they still have enough, you have enough growth that people walking through it, first of all, they're not gonna just generally walk through it if it's waist high. It's gonna be fishermen mostly or kids looking for frogs and things like that. We want people to do that. So by then it can withstand the foot traffic and come back. So that, those are some of the establishment practices that, that we've used. And this, these are the same pond bank uh, in May, in the upper left, in July on the upper right, and in September in the bottom there. So you can see you know, how in the spring it's green, that's actually a bunch of um, zizia that comes in and blooms yellow, and then you have the monardas and the cone flowers, and now you have the grasses and some of the goldenrod, you know, coming in later in the season. And then you'll notice in that upper right, upper left picture, if you will, you can kind of see the mowed turf, then you can see tall grass, and then you can see the native forbs. Well, that tall grass is actually turf grass that the park district didn't mow. When we, re, when we re, uh, repaired this bank, we had to put the fence out further. When we took the fence down, they kept mowing it where the fence was. They never went to mow this edge. So we had a constant problem of getting them to mow to where they should have mowed right up to the edge of the natives. It took us a while to get them to do that. And the, the transition between turf and natives is almost always your weediest uh, area for maintenance because the landscapers typically don't like to mow too close and then the natives start to grow out a little bit. So there's one or two natives and they think, oh, well, I'm not supposed to know the, mow the natives. They don't mow it, they don't treat it for weeds and then Queen Anne's lace and Canadian thistle and all their types of weeds start to grow in from the turf because that's not being maintained. And uh, then they start to move into the natives. But everybody says, oh, your natives are weedy. Well, that's not really the case. It's that transition where it's not being maintained properly. So another thing just to be aware of as you get involved with maintenance of these detention basins. So that was a basin that had water in it. This is a detention basin without water in it. So it's a dry bottom basin. And this basin you'll see in the upper left was all turf. So this was a, a park district owned property on a corner intersection in a residential neighborhood. I mean, it's great looking in turf. I mean, it's very attractive, rolling hills. I'm sure kids would sled there in the winter and run down the hills during the season and so forth. But a lot of people in the community were starting to say, why are we mowing this turf? Can't we convert this to native? We'd like some passive recreation areas in our community. We want the benefit of pollinators. So it was actually the community that asked that some of these areas be converted as they are now better informed that, you know, an area of natives is really better for our community and for the environment than um, turf is. Now, also keep in mind that some people want to play baseball and soccer, and some people don't. So one type of recreation is called active recreation, another is called passive recreation. So, and in our communities, there are people who want active, particip active um, recreation, there's some that want passive. So there's something there for everybody, and it, you know, it doesn't all have to be turf, and it doesn't all have to be natives. So there are ways, you know, ways of doing that. So here's a dry turf basin, right, that gets water sometime and then, you know, drains after it rains. So on the upper left is in January. The lower right is in May when we killed out the turf, getting ready to seed it. And then uh, upper left on this second slide is after the seeding. So what we did was we killed the turf, left it in place, broadcast the seed over the top of the dead turf, then came in with a Harley rake, a track unit with a Harley rake, which is a spinning shaft that has nubs on it that scarifies the surface of the ground. Because you have, just like everything else you plant, you have to have good seed soil contact. So we scarify the surface, work the native seed just into the surface, and we allow that dead grass then to be the blanket 
to protect that. So instead of coming in with a straw blanket, which would about double our planting cost, we use the old existing turf. So you can do that on a basin like this. If you had steep slopes, you may not be able to do that. And then in July, so we seeded this in May, and then in July on the right side, you'll see the cover crop coming in, mostly seed oats, but we, Bedrock, also uses Cosmos in our cover crop the first year because what we found is that in the built environment, if we just go with the standard native seed mix with cover crop, it's all green. Sometimes you get a little bit of black-eyed Susans come in the first year, but not always. And so people, when they don't know what's been going on, they just think the park district stopped mowing and let the weeds start to grow. But if we put a little bit of Cosmos in the mix, then we get this, you know, later in the season. You know, this is September, and you can see that pastel-y pink, white color where it's, um, you know, the, so the community right away accepts the area and the transition from turf to natives. This is what they get in one year. And so they say, oh, that's nice. It looks like wildflowers. It's not wildflowers. Those are annuals. You know, so a lot of purists say, oh, you shouldn't do that. And I agree, you probably shouldn't, except that we work in a built environment where we have to win hearts and minds as well as do the conversions. And so sometimes we do and sometimes we don't use um, a little bit of annual color in there. But on the lower right slide, really the reason for that slide is if you look at the bottom of the sign, you'll see little native seedlings have established within one year. So there's purple cone flower, there's yellow cone flowers, you know, that are already coming in. And that's what we're really seeking because in the first, native plants take three years to establish. The first year, the only thing that happens is that the seeds germinate and they start to put down some roots. You get some little seedlings. Some plants, like I said, black-eyed Susans, a few of the others you'll get some color with, but not many. And then the second year, they start to grow a little bit. And then by the third year, they're starting to bloom. And so that's why you have to warn people that the natives take three years to establish that doesn't mean they're mature. That just means they're established. You'll see your natives change year after year after year. We have plantings that are 10 years old, and every year, based upon the weather and the conditions and the, you know the patterns and all that kind of stuff, we'll see a different expression of the native plants from year to year, even as they get older. So, but this was this is something that you might want to consider the use of a showy cover crop in the build environment. And then this is the second year. Okay, in the early spring, this is what it looked like in the spring. It doesn't look real nice, you know, in the up that upper picture. Still a few little bare spots and things like that it looks like in the spring. But those are all native plants that are covering the ground and coming in. And then the lower right picture, unfortunately, I didn't get one in midsummer. This is late in the season. So that's sneezeweed down in the bottom. That's a native plant. And the brown plants all the way around the upper end are all those black-eyed Susans that bl bloomed. The blanket of yellow, you know, in the in the second growing season, um, on the upper banks during the summer, and then in the lower areas, we use two different seed mixes here for wet seed and the dry seed. Um, and so they had color year round in this basin year two from native plants. And this, if you look at this picture titled cover crop, hopefully that's on your screen. This this is an area where a community had flooding. And so the county bought back the homes and tore them down. So what you're looking at here is the, right down the middle of this picture is where the two property lines met. And on the left-hand side is a property that the county planted and did or didn't maintain, as you want, whatever you want to say. And on the right side is an area that Bedrock had seeded and planted. So if you look at that, you'll see the Queen Anne's lace and all the weeds and stuff growing in on the left. And that's what most people see in the first year of growth. Actually, on the left, it was planted in the fall. And on the right, it was planted in the spring. So to me, if the lot that's on the left was next to my house, I would object to that. If the lot that's on the right was next to my house, I wouldn't object to that because it looks intentional. And that's all I'm saying. I'm saying as you're managing created native areas in the built environment, you need to think about what's going to be acceptable or everybody's going to say, Oh, yeah, I've seen natives before. They just look like weeds, and they do, and they did, and that's why people think that. So we need to change that mindset by managing the process properly until the natives can show the beauty that I showed you in some of those earlier slides. And so that's why we do it this way, to kind of manage 
and we use the cover crops to make sure that they come in that way. And these are this is the same area, but you can just see the difference between the appearance of those two areas. Hey, Bill, I just want to. Uh you and I had talked about this in the beginning, but remind you to, we are getting a little bit of lag with the slides. So um, thanks for your patience, everybody. We are on the cover crop slide right now, which I think is okay. still where you are. Okay, and I just changed it to, to another another type of a basin. Okay. okay it'll, so it'll the next, next, one, next one is coming up is titled, yeah, channelized turf to natives. Okay, so that'll be coming up. And this is another turf, turf basin conversion that we did about two years ago. And the desire here was, this is a municipal basin. And uh, you know, they had a hard time mowing. If you look at the lower right picture, you'll see how wet it is. And you, know, they could, you can see some tire marks in there where their mowers got stuck and so forth. So over the years, this basin had been channelized. So they, it got wet and then it sediment filled in. So they had an excavator come in and scoop out a straight line from the inflow to the outflow. And interestingly, it was the same excavator 20 years later that I hired to come in to do the, the uh, channelizing of the um, serpentine channels that were, that were designed into this. So the municipality, what's happening in Illinois is that as the Clean Water Act continues to press municipalities to put cleaner and cleaner water into the streams, they're trying to figure out how to do that. Right? And one of the ways is you build more effective sewage treatment plants that take more pollutants out of the sewage before they dump them back into our streams and rivers. Or you can stop sediment and debris that comes off of our roadways and from construction and all from ever getting there. And so what they're finding is that if they will convert some of these turf detention basins that were built decades ago into native basins, they're getting more filtering, cleansing, cooling and they can get more credits and they can get cleaner water without having to rebuild their sewage treatment plants. And they're starting to realize that some of the metrics for clean water aren't really the proper metrics either. So there's only a certain amount of things that you can do by one process that you can do by others. So long way of saying that if you can take some of these turf basins and convert them to natives, we can continue to help improve clean water in, in, our, in our environment, which We've done a great job over the years. I mean, if you look at things that you notice today, you've probably seen a lot more hawks in your lifetime than probably my parents saw in their lifetime as we've created habitats that bring them back. So I'm encouraged in my lifetime with what I've seen over clean water and clean air that, you know, were worse probably five decades ago than they are today. So this is another way that they can do it. So you can take the water and instead of having go in a straight line from the inlet to the outlet, you run it through a serpentine path, and that probably doubles or triples the distance it has to go from when it comes in to when it goes out. Most rainfalls are one inch or less. Most rainfalls don't flood this basin. Most rainfalls flow through this basin. So if we can triple the length of the distance that the water has to go, and we can put native plants in there that will filter that water out, we can then use these basins as an effective filtration, cooling, cleansing tool to help improve the water quality. And that's what the design was all about in this in this basin. So I'm gonna show you a series of slides here and if we're not in sync, you'll catch up with them. But the next basin now is in the upper left picture, you'll see a basin where uh, it looked kind of nasty, but it had just been graded out. The lines, white lines are painted in there where we're gonna be having to seed different varieties. And this basin was seeded in 2000, the spring of 2019. I'm not sure how it was where you live, but where we live, it rained and it rained and it rained and it rained. So we had killed this basin out early in the season, season ready to do the conversion, but we couldn't get the excavator in there because the basin was wet until almost July. And so by the time we did that, the weed, the weed grasses had started to grow back on the basin banks there. You'll see those. And you know, we had to treat that. So we treated this area a second time or third time right before we did the seeding. So even though it looks like all that stuff is alive, it'll be dead in another 10 days. So, so that, that upper left is the basin after grading. The serpentine channel had already been cut and there was a little four bay in there. And then there were a couple little sediment ponds right before they 
left the basins as well. On the lower right, you'll see some of my guys spreading seed. And when we spread native seed, we mix it in the field and then we spread it. We use five gallon buckets and we hand broadcast it in two directions to make sure we get the coverage that we need. And we typically ask the seed nursery to remove any ryegrass. They use a combination of seed oats and annual ryegrass. Well, a lot of the annual ryegrass is awfully perennial sometimes. And so our experience has been that if we get ryegrass in our seed mixes, sometimes we can't get rid of it in the native plantings. So I have them remove the ryegrass and then we add 50 pounds of seed oats per acre when we do the installations. And that helps us to, because native seed, the quantity is very small that you put down. And so the seed oats act as a carrier for the seed, but it also gives me a little more of a dense cover crop because weeds like to grow where they get full sun, where they get a lot of sun. So if I can get the cover crop to come in to shade the soil just enough that the weeds won't grow, but my native seedlings will emerge, that's what I want. So that's what we try to do. We try to get a little bit of heavier cover than they ordinarily would send us from the nursery uh, to try to get them in. Then after that seed has been broadcast, we run over that surface with a Harley rake. And on your next slide, you'll see a picture of the Harley rake running there. And this is a stand-on unit. This was a, probably only of a quarter acre, half acre basin. And um, then we pulverize the surface, get that seed soil contact. And this one having been done in July, we did blanket this basin because in July, none of the seed would survive if we didn't. You got to remember when a seed emerges, it has one seed, it has one leaflet going up and one tender root going down. And if the soil dries out at that day when that seed emerges, the seed dies, the plant is dead, you're not going to get anything to grow. So you have to have something to protect that seed in that um, very critical time period. So in native areas, we do not irrigate native areas after seeding. Instead, we use the blanket and then we'll let nature take care of it. The native seed will emerge when it gets the moisture that it wants and it'll grow in. So the blanket does two things. It helps with the water retention, moisture retention to protect the seed. Uh, and it also prevents it from washing away if there's any you know, rainwater that comes in here and flushes through this basin. So we did this planting in two phases. We did the blanking. And then you'll notice on the upper blank banks, there had been enough turf there that we were going to do what we did in that previous basin that I showed you. We were going to use that turf as the blanket. Unfortunately, because we killed it in May, by the time we got to July, that turf had all degraded. We actually had to come back and reseed that upper bank because it didn't come in very well. But this is, um, this is the next spring. You'll see the channelized basin there is when the slides come up. And you'll notice in the lower areas where it looks a little muddy but you can see the wood stakes we went in with plugs then once we knew you know there where what was growing and what wasn't we came in with wet uh, emergent plants and then wet edge plants and we planted them where they knew we thought that they would survive the best and then we put up goose protection netting which is a the we use these wooden stakes two inch by two inch by four feet drive them into the ground about 10 or 15 feet apart and then run fish line at six inches, 12 inches, 18 inches up the side to prevent geese from going in the side and then crisscrossing it over the top to keep them from flying in. And then we remove that once the plants have established. So that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing this at establishment uh, at the end of the first season and then early in the next year over here on, on the lower right-hand slide. So for a late start in the season, we got very good establishment in this basin. And then when the slide comes up, uh, the final slides show you what the basin bottom looks like from an aerial. These were taken from a drone or somebody flying. I'm not sure how exactly they got it. So on the lower slide, what you'll see, you can see that basin, but you'll notice the upper edge looks like it's been mowed. And in fact, that's what happened. The municipality, the fellow who does the mowing for them thought, oh, that area looks a little whatever. I'm going to go ahead and mow that. So he mowed down that very area that we were having a hard time to get growing. He went in and mowed it after we had seeded it, reseeded it, and actually installed some plugs there um, to get it to fill in. Yeah, they mowed it. So, you know, we got that resolved. But you have all these issues. So sometimes we will put stakes every 50 feet or along the outer edge 
just so the mowers know where to edge. And that's worked pretty well in most of our properties. And then you've seen the sign that we sometimes put there to native area establishment, do not mow. But if you look at this basin, you remember what it looked like uh, beforehand with the channelized basin, you can see how much more distance it has now, and more opportunity for the water to be filtered and cleansed as it goes through this basin. And now we have a habitat. One other brief story I'll tell you about this basin is that the larger area up there when we first went in in the first year, by the fall, cattails were already growing in there. So I asked one of my guys to go in, put a pair of waders on and pull the cattails out. They were still young. When he went in, he had dragonflies landing on his head. As he was pulling the cattails out, he had dragonfly larvae climbing up his hand and the empty shells were hanging on the dead cattail plants that he was pulling out. So within three months, we had dragonflies in three stages of life flying around and already in there. So it's kind of like the baseball field, build it and they will come. Well, same way with the natives, you build it and these insects come and that life restarts again. I don't know where these insects, because there's a huge variety of insects that come that are plant specific, but they show up. It's amazing, it's absolutely amazing. Okay, so then, you know, I'll show you, I'm gonna move on a little more, a little more quickly. Here's another one, this is a bank that wanted to have a memorial garden for one of the people that died. So this one we did, it was small. We killed it, we seeded it, we blanketed it. And after we did that, you know, they put a bench by the edge and so forth. And this just shows you the first year results of what you can kind of expect it to look like, um, you know, by August. This is another uh, commercial detention basin. You know, this is year two. Shows you the color that you can get, kind of what you expect. Uh, the upper left is in the spring. Hopefully you're on the slide that says commercial detention basin. It's spring, looks a little ratty. But by the summer, very nice. This is this is typically what you'll see of a second year planting here on the right. The black eyed Susans in bloom on the slopes and then the wetland plants having a little different uh, plant community, some more sedges and things like that down there, not quite as colorful. This next slide is a, a university planting we did around their existing detention base and the bottom is full of Phragmites. This basin actually drains the local community and uh, when it rains, this basin bounces 25 feet, floats any logs that are in the bottom, and anything else. But you can see that the natives established very nicely on the slopes of this basin, a variety of plants, some uh, butterfly weeds, some uh, looks like yellow cone flowers, and I don't know what else growing in there, you know, but the natives are, you know, have come in that on that one. These are uh, native turf areas, which I showed you once before. In this one where it says native turf areas, you see the brilliant cedar that drills the native seed. You'll see the colorful along the driveway. And then on the right, you'll see the mowed strip. And you got to remember in the built environment, you shouldn't put your natives right up to the sidewalks or right up to the driveway, probably in most cases. Probably ought to have a mowed strip there for maintenance as people drive in and out. It's just this kind of a architectural um, principle or, or feature that you want to think about. How do you separate them? How do you create a transition in view? You know, as you kind of are funneling the people's path of egress, you want them to be visually directed, you know, into where they're supposed to be going. So you got pavement that's low, you got turf that's kind of med intermediate on the top of the curb, and then you have the taller natives further out to the sides. And then these are the same areas in, you know, third year, you're seeing the color here on these basin slopes, you got the Monarda coming in and the purple cone flowers and you know, all kinds of stuff blooming by the third year. This is kind of what you can expect with your native plantings. All right, and then I'm gonna, uh, we're getting a little bit, I'm gonna leave some time for questions. Um, these are some more commercial basins, a fall planting. That's why I wanted to show you these pictures. This is a fall planting, what we got from planting in September. And then the, um end of the let's see the end of the next year this is what we had so the first slide was when it was planted the second year was the spring and you can see that that looks pretty lousy in the upper left lousy enough that the client asked me bill is that going to survive do we need to oversee that and i quite frankly asked myself the same question when i looked at that but sure enough you know without 
that showy cover crop, if you do it in the fall, you can't put that showy cover crop in because the annual seeds won't survive the winter. But by the end of the year, we had vervains, we had asters, we had yellow cone flowers, we had some of the coreopsis came in. So we had a pretty nice mix of color by the end of the second year and end of the first year growing season. And then this is the second year. The spring in the upper left hand corner looks a lot better. You can see all the native plants coming in and what it looks like then in the middle of the summer. Very nice, attractive, you know, what they had hoped for, you know, and sometimes you just kind of have to hold people's hands. And I have a client who keeps telling me, Bill, you just got to be patient during these establishments. Just be patient. It'll be fine. It'll come in. And they do. Sometimes they may not come in in two. They might take three. They might take four years, but they come in. As long as you know you have good seed soil contact and the seed is there, they will eventually come in. Just means some of your weed problems and things like that might be. Uh, a little more of an issue. All right, I'm going to skip through a few other things. All right, so some native plant field notes. Uh, these are not natural areas, they are created native planting, so modify the seed mix to your location. Plants only grow in habitats to which they're adapted, three to five years for establishment, and then think about native plant structure in the build environment. So those are all things to consider when you're talking about these. And then a few last thoughts. Rainwater and organic matter are not waste products. You know, we've treated rainwater as a waste product to collect it, put it into gutters, run it down our roadways, put it into pipes, flood, send it in the river and let them flood out St. Louis. You know, it's not a waste product. You know, we need to capture it, use it as much as possible where it falls. Clean, fresh water is a resource. Same thing with organic matter. We shouldn't be collecting it, putting it in bags and hauling it away. You need to keep it on the properties where they are. And then native plantings need to be an important part of our water treatment train, you know, as the last thought there. They do require maintenance. So green infrastructure does require maintenance, uh, which is typically, you know, mowing if you can't burn, burning once it's past its third year and it's established, you have to have a certain amount of biomass. Some of these detention basins can't be burned because they're too close to buildings or fences. They plant evergreens near them, so you mow them instead spot herbicide them, spot cut them to get, keep the weeds out. Okay, so native plants are not as widely used as they should be, but thank you for your interest and thank you for the things that you're doing to help change that and your interest. And I think at this point, Jamie, we should take some questions. All right, thank you so much, Bill. There was so much information in there. That was really wonderful. Um, I haven't seen any questions pop up yet, but if you do have questions, please go ahead and throw them either into the chat or the Q&A box. All right. Um, Rebecca wants to know, are there any special considerations for establishing a native planting on an earthen dam to ensure the process doesn't damage the dam or allow water infiltration? Great question. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, I don't know about special considerations. I mean, the native plants, would seem to me, I don't know about the structure of building an earthen dam, but it would seem to me that native plants would be a good way to go because they have deep and very fibrous roots that which, which would help hold that earthen dam. So I think the important thing are just the same principles is to make sure that the area that you're going to seed the natives is protected until they get established so that no erosion begins on that earthen dam until they're established. All right. Bill, if you don't mind, um, I've got, I, I put together a little slide with some contact information for you. Do you mind if I put that up so that people can, if, you know, if they have questions, they can email you or visit your website? Nope, please go ahead and do that. Okay. And I'm going to turn off my slides, um, there we Jamie, go. is that right? Okay. All right, so there you go. You can see Bill's contact information there um, in his website. If you have any questions, you can you can visit there as well. All right, let's see. We've got any other questions? I'm not seeing any other ones pop up. Um, Joseph, I see you raising your hand, but unfortunately, because of the webinar format, you got to type your question. 
um, we can't turn on your audio there. So, um, but please feel free to, to type out a question for us. Okay, so I see a question here. What's the best way to kill off weeds from a Julie? A Ju Julie, so there's, if you think about the weeds, there's three types of weeds, right? There's annual weeds, biennial weeds, and perennial weeds. Annual weeds, can, you can interrupt their cycle by stopping them from going to seed. So annual weeds in the native areas, best to, you can stop them by cutting. So we use a, a line trimmer with a triangular blade on the front, so it's a handheld brush cutter. And we cut the cut the weed seeds in large areas. You can mow them. So the natives, while they're getting established, you want to do you want to stop the annuals, the biennials, and the perennial weeds. So during establishment, the first year you'll get a lot of annual weeds that come up. So typically, in the first year of a native planting, you'll mow it. You can mow it twice. You can mow it if you seed it in the spring. You can mow it in the late or early midsummer, and then in the late summer to stop your annual grasses from going to seed and some of the annual weeds. Some of the biennial weeds will be stopped in that same way because um, you know, you'll have a rosette that can be treated or you can have a seed stalk that goes up. And if you can cut those off before the seeds are formed, you can stop the biennial weeds. Perennial weeds, however, you can't stop from mowing or cutting. You have to herbicide those. So you'll have to spot herbicide those with an appropriate herbicide to do it. So a perennial uh, broadleaf weed, you can use your typical you know, a broadleaf weed killer that people use for lawn weeds. But for grassy weeds, you're going to have to use something that's uh, either non-selective or specific for grasses. So you're either going to have to use a glyphosate type product for the grasses or post or something like that that's selective to grasses to kill the grasses. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I think that's one of those cases, kind of a, you know, know your enemy. So knowing more about the, the weed that you're going after in its life cycle can be really useful. So if you got something like um, burdock, for example, you know, if, if you learn more about its life cycle, you learn that it's a two year plant. First year is just a little rosette on the ground. If you're going after that, you can, you know, spot treat it with an herbicide or the second year is when it puts up that seed head, cut those seed heads off before the seeds have a chance to fall and that plant's going to die off. So you may have to do that, a, a, you know, a, for a few years in a row to get all the seeds out of the seed bank. But, you know, again, that's why I said kind of knowing your enemy um, helps you know the best way to treat it. Yeah, and then I'd also say that the best weed control is a healthy native stand, right? Absolutely. Weed control on your lawn, right? The best weed control on the lawn is a healthy turf. It's the same way with the natives. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to limit the weeds to give the natives a chance to, to grow in. And once you get the natives in nice and thick, your weed problems get less, but the, they, they, they seldom ever go away. I mean, you still have to maintain native areas. It's a misconception that created native areas can take care of themselves. They don't. There always has to be some stewardship or maintenance in native areas. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. Um, Rebecca wants to know, I'm curious about floating plants like water lilies and that sort of thing. Are there native options for those? Uh, I'm not a great aquatic guy. I'm not sure if I can help you with that one. Well, I know there are some, you know, the emergence that you were talking about. So things like pickerel weed, um, yeah. arrowhead, all of those like to grow right there on the shoreline. We say they have wet feet, you know, so they like to have their roots actually in the water. Um, so yeah, there are there are definitely some options for that. Um, I th uh, the ones you mentioned are right, and there's some sedges and rushes that'll yeah. grow in there as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, I'm, I'm thinking yeah. about the native plant brochure we put out. I don't think we've got any actual like um, water loving plants in there, unless you look at our rain garden brochure the center zone, when you see kind of the donut picture for rain gardens, that center zone, um, those would be more of your edge species, the, the guys that like to live right or along the edge where the water meets the land. All right, um, Joseph wants to know, is the foundation helping water treatment plants consider native plantings for detention ponds? I live in Elmhurst and we have installed many ponds and spent millions of dollars. Um, we work with anybody that comes to us. So 
Um, what, with certain municipalities, we have agreements with them where we will help them with their, um, any of their conservation goals. Um, but if they don't come to us, you know, we don't necessarily go to them saying, you have to do this, you have to do this. It's, it really works better if it's more of a partnership. So if the village of Elmhurst was interested in getting um, native plantings around there, we would certainly love to consult with them and work with them on that. Um, Elmhurst is definitely a, a, in an area that we work in. So um, if you're in, involved with the city at all, or if you know people there, definitely pass on our information. We're more than happy to, to help them with that. All right, any other questions that anybody has? Oh, Kim has a question. Oh, she's contributing to our, our discussion on um, water plants, um, American lotus, yellow lotus. Um, I am not sure how to pronounce, I'm so bad with scientific names. Nolumbo lutea, maybe? Um, but yeah, there are definitely native, what might commonly be called water lilies. Um, American lotus is definitely a good one of those. It's got a really bizarre looking flower, it's kind of cool. Thank you for that feedback, Kim. Any other questions that anybody has? Oh, I don't, um, let's see. I think that's all we've got then. So I'm gonna stop that. And with that, I wanna say a big thank you to Bill Bedrosian for joining us today. Um, so much great information there. Uh, we really, really appreciate you and everything that Bedrock has done with us, in this presentation included, but everything else you have done with us. So we are, we are so grateful to have you as one of our foundation friends. Yes, absolutely. Conservation Foundation does great work. It's our pleasure to be able to support the work that you do. And thank you for the opportunity today. And thank you for everybody's time. And, and Jamie, uh, pass my information. If you have any other questions, feel free to drop me an email or give me a call. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, absolutely. And my email is the one that's included um, in the emails that you got from Zoom about this webinar. So if you have any questions or anything like that, please feel free, drop me an email. I am happy to answer any of those questions. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you. Take care, everybody, stay safe. And we hope to see you again next week with Farmer Jason to talk about organic farming at the Conservation Foundation's uh, Green Earth Harvest. So thanks everybody, take care, bye-bye.